the Minister for Health. And uh, she is part of the Science Committee on COVID-19. And uh, she's also a consultant and chairperson of the Department of Psychiatry at the College of Health Sciences. That's Makerere University. Now, on the other end, we'll have two people joining us via Zoom. Of course, this is what the pandemic has uh, limited us to. So if you can't move, then we can find you wherever you are. We have Janet Kantalama. She's a psychologist and founder, of, uh, founder and executive director of Safe Places. This is a private treatment center for psychiatric and psychological disorders. Now, Jane is key in this conversation because once you're in a state of mental breakdown, you need care and critical care at that. Recovery uh, needs expertise to help. And if you, you're seeing, that's Jane there. She'll be joining us later on with Zoom. And then we have Dr. Hafsa Lukwata who will be representing the Ministry of Health. She comes in on this panel as an envoy from the ministry, and she's a focal person for mental health at the Ministry of Health. And I'd like to welcome all my panelists once again. This is a conversation that is meant to help people out there. We're dealing with a lot. First of all, this is a new thing. COVID-19 has been with us for about seven months, and... Uh, the projection is that it, it's going to be there for quite some time. The scientists, you know, you people say the virus doesn't die, so it's going to be around. So we have to find a way to live with the virus at one time or the other. But this is a new kind of virus. This is not HIV where we know where the virus uh, is and how it can be transmitted to one another. Uh, this one, we know where it is, but then... You know, it, it moves faster than uh, the, the, the other known ones. For example, HIV, or we've dealt with Ebola before, highly infectious, but we've contained it. This one required us to, you know, stay in our houses. Could be compared to the Spanish flu, but Spanish flu was a bit too tough. Killed millions of people, close to 500 or, you know, more. And, you know, it, it has come and brought side effects. Not only disease, but you know, the first time actually here in Uganda we started hearing about COVID was, you know, I think mid-Jan around there, uh, towards the end of Jan, that's when the conversation actually uh, picked up uh, with COVID until we registered our first case on the 21st of March. But videos were already moving around, uh, some fake, some true. And we were seeing people falling on the streets, uh, you know, caskets everywhere, people in ICU. And in this brought a lot of fear. And that is what anxiety is, which later leads to stress. Now, let me start with uh, our professor here. Uh, I, I want you to help us understand, you know, when we talk about anxiety, it, it's a... Uh, you just say a medical term, but for one to understand it better, how best would you describe it? Thank you very much uh, for that question. So uh, to explain anxiety uh, simply, when one is put in a situation where there may be a threat mm. to their lives, mm. that this person, in most cases, it's equivalent to death. The yeah. That's how the brain interprets it. The body reacts in a way with you getting fear towards that object or situation yeah. so that you can be able to run away at the basic level. Now, in most cases, you cannot be able to run away from such situations. So you remain with this fear within yourself that will show with things like um, your heart beating very fast. Yeah. Uh, you may get shaky. You start to sweat. Um, you are in this state of heightened alertness that, you know, should I get an outing out of this situation, I'm ready to run away. Mm. That is at the basic level, and that's how we are created. So anxiety is a normal reaction. I want to say that <laughs> from, from the start, yeah. that it is normal for us to feel anxious or to feel afraid when we are put into a situation where our lives are threatened. Mm. 
So all reactions that people have been getting towards COVID-19, just like to previous other threatening situations like, um, you know, the Ebola that you talked about, yeah. or any other thing, a road traffic accident, um, uh, uh, hearing gunshots shooting off somewhere, it is a normal reaction. Yeah. The challenge comes with, the, with that becoming a sustained kind of uh, situation for the individual, especially when you do not take away the threatening event. Uh, in this case, COVID-19, as you've said, it doesn't seem to be going away. Mm. And uh, for some people, you either adjust and learn how to live with it, or for others, they fail to make that adjustment and then will progress to develop um, total disorders that actually need to be managed uh, with the care like uh, uh, you've mentioned Kantarama is on, uh, on here, yeah. as well as other psychiatrists. Um, but that said, when we get sit individuals who are in that kind of uh, situation, it is always important for us to be able to respond, to limit uh, the development of those future disorders that I've talked about. So even though we may <coughs> not diagnose them as individuals who have a disorder, mm. we do recognize that it's an anxious situation and people need to be helped out of that situation. Okay, so before we get to even the point of diagnosis, mm -hmm. because you know, it's, you'd say, like culture, uh, many of us here in Uganda will not run quickly to the hospital when we feel an ease, you know, in our bodies. Uh, we will only go when that an ease continues and actually turns out to either pain or, you know, uh, you see your body part is changing color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But sometimes even you people advise us not to quickly run to the hospital for some small, small things. Mm. Uh, because in the hospital then uh, probably you'd let your body uh, deal with some small illnesses, which is you know, true. Uh, but also in times like this, then you'd want to prevent that other person from contracting a certain disease mm -hmm. by not coming to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And this is what you know, COVID has brought to us. So how do we then tell that, you know, I think this kind of fear that I have is now running out of hand. It's, it's no longer the natural response of the body. It's now something that we have to deal with precisely. All right. So um, if you're having um, other things getting impaired, for example, you have started not being able to sleep at night, uh, you're starting to lose appetite, um, for food, yeah. uh, you're losing concentration in being able to do things uh, that you normally have to do, um, you should start getting worried that maybe this fear I have of this thing, and the fear is constantly in your mind. You're, that's all you're thinking about all the time, nothing else. You should start getting worried uh, that uh, something is, is you know, uh, going wrong and I need to maybe seek uh, medical attention. Now, usually, um, it takes a bit of a while. So if you've had the symptoms for longer than two weeks, you know, it is persistent. Almost every day you're feeling the same mm. because as human beings, our emotions keep on varying day to day. Mm. And um, I may be very anxious if I've just had news about someone, but by the end of the day, I may have cooled down. Mm. But uh, for individuals who are going to be facing challenges, you find that day in, day out, for m most of the day, you're actually feeling, you know, the things that I've um, <coughs> highlighted. And in, in addition, you're starting to become dysfunctional or not be able to do the things that you normally would have done. Um, in terms of, say, uh, looking after your house or being able to do the work that you're supposed to be doing. Okay. Uh, you did explain to us that, uh, you know, some of the some of the signs of anxiety will be, you know, change in our daily ways, our daily habits, sleeping patterns, eating habits. And when we talk about eating habits, I want to, you know, call on Dr. Kasenene. Yes. The people that you, you know, come to you, what percentage, you know, comes with anxiety uh, or stress? 
and, and how do you determine you know from the eating pattern? So um, thank you for the question. Um, interestingly, um, the number of people presenting with issues around mental health, although slight, for example, um, low mood or anxiety feelings, is actually quite high. I usually have a questionnaire, like I was telling you earlier, where we ask people to um, explain the symptoms that they have, and we find that up to seven or eight out of 10 have some of these um, symptoms. And so it's important for um, many of the listeners and the viewers to understand that the spectrum of uh, mental health issues varies from very mild to very severe, as Dr. Uh, Professor Nakasuja was saying. But um, we need to be able to realize that any of us can be affected, and so we need to begin to know what these symptoms are. But when I see them, I begin to explain and help them to understand the relationship between what they are presenting with, maybe the, their main reason for coming, whether it's a weight or a nutritional issue or something like diabetes, and, and how their emotions and their mental health is. Mm. And, and just to show them that it's something that anybody can be affected with and need to understand. But from a dietary point of view, um, many times the, what you feel in your body is mediated by um, chemicals like neurotransmitters and hormones and vitamins and minerals. Mm. And you need to have enough of these in your body to be able to respond or to have a normal response to to different situations. And people, especially who have had a lot of stress or tense lives or busy lives, tend to quickly have depletion of these uh, nutrients like serotonin and vitamin B12 and all these B vitamins. And so they then become at risk to have these symptoms. And so what someone is eating is very important, especially if they have uh, a risk factor for these kinds of conditions or like in COVID generally in this time, mm. we are all experiencing different levels of anxiety and fear. So it's important that we eat well. And so you need to be eating foods that are going to support your body to have the right amount of nutrients and eating less of the ones that will, you know, cause inflammation and will not support your health. So diet plays a very big role in the way our bodies are able to cope with stressful situations. And sometimes may actually be the trigger between having a normal response and starting to progress, like you said, to points where maybe you need further help. So it's, it's very, very important. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if you have just joined us, we are live on uh, very many platforms, Twitter, uh, YouTube. Uh, we're also going to have some people ask questions on Zoom. And we're also live on UBC TV. So thank you for joining us. But then if you probably are out there and you want to, you know, catch up with the conversation, you can follow the Twitter handles for the Ministry of Health, Government of Uganda, uh, UBC TV. My own Twitter handle, at Walter Mwesije, uh, uh, has uh, all the other links where you can uh, be able to follow this conversation. And I, I want us to, you know, go to Dr. Benedict, who now deals with the people at Wutarika. If somebody has gone past... Uh, the levels that uh, Professor Noel in here has been telling us, you know, past two weeks and then they are brought to you. What exactly happens? I know Butarika sounds, you know, not a good place to go to because of the attachment that people have given it. But, you know, it's a facility just like any other facility, just like Mulago, just like, you know, any other hospital that would go to. And uh, we actually, if you didn't know, uh, Butarika Hospital doesn't only deal with mental health issues. It provides other health services, you know, services like uh, uh, maternal health uh, and, and many other, you know, health services. So don't only think that when you go to Butarika, you've been taken there for mental health. But at that point, Dr. Benedict, what do you do with such people? Right. Thank you very much. So um, to begin with, very important to know that once you have a brain, you're at risk of mental illness. Yeah. Right. So how would you want to be treated? Would you want to be labeled as Butarika? Yeah. Right. And uh, we had a, uh, a chat before, and you said how amazing Butarika is. Yeah. So usually what happens for people to come into care, 
yes, uh, like Professor said, the illness has affected your functioning, right? So you're either danger to yourself or the community. So once you come into hospital, we take you into care. And um, the care in mental health comes from the three aspects. We'll do the biological aspect where we'll investigate, run routine blood tests, so on and so forth, and give medication. Then we have the psychosocial aspect where we have the psychologist come in and the sociologist come in to have talk therapy and deal with what is happening. For example, Professor said, um, all of us are really having it very difficult adjusting to the new normal, right? So one of the things the psychotherapy will come in is to help you deal with the new normal, how you can deal with it. And for the sake of, of this talk is more of how can you prevent these disorders so that you don't get or you don't lose function. So yes, so we have therapy sessions that also help you do that. So it's uh, basically holistic care from the treatment to the psychotherapy. All right, and at the point of, you know, coming to the hospital, because I know many of us fear to go to the hospital, and that means we fear to actually be treated. So what would be the dangers, you know, when I don't come early to the hospital? Right, right. So it's very important to arrest the disease before it wasn't, because all these... Uh, diseases, for example, they have complications. Um, I'll give you an example of depression. Once you've had a sad mood, you've lost interest in pleasurable activities, and it's affected your functioning, quite a number of people, well, you come at that point and you help you before it worsens to the extent of you actually wanting to take your life or attempting suicide. So it's very, very important for you to actually look out for the danger signs yeah. or people around you. Most of the times, actually, the people who are mentally ill do not notice they have a problem. So it's very important for the people around you to look out for you. Be your brother's keeper. Once you notice a change in behavior of someone, if they used to be very bubbly, they would come to office and smile with everyone, speak to you. If you notice something is changing, it's very, very important to reach out and actually find out what's going on. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned something that is very key, and I want uh, Professor Nakasuja here to you know, break it down for us. Mm -hmm we react differently. Mm. Uh, how would you say would be the reactions? It uh, does it differ in terms of ages? Does it differ in terms of uh, uh, physical capability? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what's the difference? So um, how we may react to a particular situation depends, first of all, majorly from our previous experiences. Yeah. So that in a way um if i could speak uh, specifically say for covid in this situation yeah. if one really felt that their life were threatened and then they continue to feel that their life may be threatened part of the disorders that you were talking about that may come in the future are things like post-traumatic stress disorder which can be very impairing uh, for a person to continue functioning because most of the time they are living in a panic should I say situation? So um, the just a bit. Uh, just remind me a bit. What was the other? Yeah, I, I wanted you to, you know, tell us uh, what uh, or how do we react? We react yeah, differently, yeah. and yeah. who is more vulnerable? Right. So we react differently. Uh, first of all, as I've said from previous um, uh, experiences. Uh, vulnerability uh, comes in, there may be no difference between, you know, ages or, yeah. you know, sexes, uh, but the issue of previous um, experiences uh, plays a, a very key role. And also what is done at the time that you're facing this thing uh, becomes very important. So, for example, uh, when COVID came and people had to stay home, uh, stay locked up, uh, they don't have food, uh, they have to survive to the next day. Uh, they, other than worrying about the disease, they start to worry about what it is that they are going to eat. And then someone comes in and is able to provide them with food. Uh, someone comes in and explains to them what is happening. Um, it helps the person process the situation. 
so that they can be able to kind of calm down. Yeah. But if you do not respond to those people's needs at, at that point, or if, for example, let's suppose uh, this was like, um, I mean, this is the same like Ebola or COVID. If we don't take away the person from the immediate danger, so for example, we knew that COVID was mainly coming in through people who are flying back yeah. uh, from uh, uh, listening countries. to other, um, what had happened to other places. Yeah. So blocking the border was a kind of reassurance for the individual. So you have to stop that insult from getting into the person's face. And I hope people can appreciate why the lockdown was uh, put in place at that time. Mm. Then you organize yourself on how you can be able to handle this situation moving forward. Um, when you do not pre prepare yourself and uh, people remain with the fear of contracting the disease, that just heightens, you know, uh, things. So irrespective of whatever age that you, you may be. Mm. Of course, children, on the other hand, many times may not understand things very well. Mm. And it is important for adults to explain to them in simple language of what is going on. Because when they are put out of school, when they cannot play with their friends, uh, they usually believe the world has come to an end. And that can be a very scary situation for a child too. So adult communication to children also helps them, um, you know, uh, adapt to the new situation. Yeah, you know, uh, we've seen many of these things in movies where, uh, you know, of course, movies are imaginary. With the world has come to an end. Mm -hmm. It's only one guy who's living life out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And children tend to you know grasp these things and they now almost turn them into reality mm -hmm. uh, getting uh, weird dreams and what would those be the indicators for children of course children uh, things uh, they will be unsettled they may get clingy they don't you know they'd really become very afraid of what's happening and they may get nightmares too if they're children who may be um, uh, who may tend to get, because uh, not everyone gets nightmares, but yes, yeah. in the severe case, yeah. yes, that could be a sign of uh, the heightened fear that the children are having. But for most of the time, it may also be a change in behavior, yeah. um, because the, in trying to adjust to this uh, sense of anxiety, then they may be develop behavior that they didn't have before. Some of them may regress in their behavior. Uh, they may have you know, grown well enough to be able to do certain things for themselves, and now you find them doing things which they did at a younger age, which may not be in line with uh, the age that they have at the moment. Okay. Uh, they may seclude themselves or keep to themselves, so you will notice it through mainly the way they are behaving. All right, so we have uh, Dr. Afswa uh, Lukwata and uh, Jane Kantalama on the other side. They will be joining us via Zoom, but the professor here mentioned something to do with nutrition and of course this is evident because uh, the lockdown has its own side effects and feeding patterns are going to change either for the worst or for the best for some people and at that point I want Dr. Kasenene to you know help us and explain to us how best would one uh, you know maintain a healthy feeding lifestyle you know to the bare minimum because when they announced that uh, starting tomorrow there will be curfew and what you know most of us went to the supermarkets and bought all those oily stuffs and what dry foods we are packing in our cupboards and fridges but in the end you know there's a very funny picture that was trending on social media mm -hmm. that this is how we went into the lockdown and it has very slim cartoons and then after the lockdown, you know, people were just like balloons and they, they were asking each other, how do we move out of this door? Yeah. Feeding habits. So feeding habits are very important. And mm -hmm. like you said, rightly, we have uh, our population and our demographic varies. So people have different um, nutrition needs as well as capacities to feed themselves. But the more, you see, like with COVID, one of the, the two things I want to highlight is one, how it impacts our immune system because this is really what is ultimately most important to stay healthy. But also I'll say something briefly about how our, our anxieties can be helped by our diet. But it's important to understand that 
whatever you put in your body has an impact. And so there are certain things that we know are not good for our health and our bodies. Yeah. And some of these things actually are, are even expensive. So just um, if we start to think about things like sugar, um, I know this is a controversial area, but sugar is a substance that immediately um, causes inflammation in your body. And some studies have shown that even in as short as five hours after consumption of sugar, you will have a, a good amount of depression of your T lymphocytes, the immune cells that keep you healthy. And so in this is a time where we really want to be thinking about keeping our immunity up. So sh uh, sugar is one thing that people should try and avoid. Um, you mentioned something about stocking up. Most of us stock up on dry rations because that's what won't go bad. Mm -hmm. But as we do that, we need to be mindful that refined foods, refined grains especially, sometimes in abundance um, without balancing them with fruits and vegetables can be a challenge. So I'm mindful of the fact that um, this is what may be available, but we need to start eating less of the refined grains and more natural food. And this is to people who can afford. Um, there are certain things we take um, which may not necessarily be nutrients, but like, for example, um, caffeine and stimulants like caffeine and alcohol um, that will actually have an immediate impact on immunity. They can actually also negatively you know, impair your body's response to fear because mm -hmm. those are the, some of the triggers and drivers. And I'm sure my colleagues will probably say something uh, about that as well. But it's mainly, uh, and then we have deep fried foods and processed foods. So we're talking things like sausages for those who can afford them stocking up on these kinds of things and deep fried foods. These are things we want to avoid. But what we need to be eating are very simply uh, natural and unrefined foods. And top of the list are vegetables. Now, many people um, think of these as boring or expensive foods, but they are not. You know, we have simple things like dodo, which in some places is a weed. And so this is one of the healthiest foods that we know that can um, boost your immunity, can keep your weight at a good level, and also provide you the nutrients that you need. So people need to eat a large amount of food from vegetables. This is nakati, dodo, buga, and anything, even if it's broccoli or cabbage and the like. Some of them are a bit expensive, but some are available. We need to eat more fruit, more natural fruit. And specifically, there are certain herbs that have been shown to be um, very useful. For example, uh, people talk about garlic and ginger and turmeric and cinnamon. And I think everybody should understand that these are very powerful foods. We should also have our legumes, our beans, our peas, our groundnuts. Um, the message is that people should eat more natural, whole, and unrefined foods and eat less of the processed and junk foods. And especially in this time, um, we want to uh, consider that to keep our immunity strong. But if I may quickly, um, we know, I want to talk about healthy fats because these are known to improve brain health, omega-3 fatty acids. Mm. Now, many of these people think of as fish oils, but they do come from things like chia seeds, like nuts, um, our regular groundnuts for those who can get almonds and cashews, um, even avocado, and even fish itself. So these are foods which may start to help <coughs> you with, um, with brain health. Um, mm -hmm. And then foods which can give you magnesium, like uh, especially, again, the green vegetables um, and the legumes. So I would just say we need to be mindful in this time, um, uh, reduce the amount of processed foods we are eating, and, um, and focus on more natural foods. So it can be a long discussion, but in summary, that's what I would say. Yeah, and uh, I'll come back to you at the point of, uh, you know, trying to come back from uh, this kind of life that has been, you know, you'd say free, and we have a lot of nothing to do, uh, meaning that probably most of us spend more hours seated or probably sleeping. And, you know, talk about things like exercising. Will they have an impact when we get back to our daily routine? But that, when we come back to you, Dr. Paul, I, I want to, you know, now... Uh, roll it to Dr. Benedict at uh, Butavika there. Uh, how do you, you know, support people uh, who have come to you 
uh, and you know are leaving the hospital I, I want to link this later to you know dealing with people in quarantine because we've seen videos where you know the community becomes hostile to these people uh, which is not a good thing but then also it, it's a same thing when somebody is admitted for you know mental issues and they have to go to, to you know Botavica I'm sure there's a package that uh, Dr. Benedict gives to the people who he attends to. Uh, how do you deal with that? Right. So um, when you've been with us for a while in the hospital and you feel you're ready to go home, to begin with, as we care for you, we involve your family members. Okay. So they come and uh, join our therapy sessions. Sometimes, like I explained to you, uh, people don't know they are ill. So you are behaving abnormally. So because you're a danger to yourself and other people, they bring you to hospital. Mm -hmm. So when you are back to normal and understand what's happening, we involve the people, your family members. Two, we have a cadre of people called social workers who actually go to the community and prepare the community to receive you. Mm -hmm. So yes, we work with a team that prepares you to go to the community, working hand in hand with your family and relatives. Okay. Have, have you seen increased numbers of people coming in uh, this time around, this uh, COVID time? So yes, um, two reasons. Uh, during the lockdown, quite a number of people could not access their basic medications yeah. and uh, so on and so forth. And number two, we are having the new normal. And uh, like a talk today is about the stress and anxiety. So we are having quite a number of people who are not able to adjust the new normal. So because that is happening, um, there's lots of adjustment disorders, people have lost their jobs, so on and so forth. So that is having a psychological impact on them. And yes, we are starting to see this number of people coming through. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I, I want to now engage uh, our panelists on the other end. And I, I want to start with Jane. Jane, if you can hear me, I want you to you know, tell us, because you, you've dealt with uh, people at your safe places, and this would be the point of care. How should we care for our people, first of all, at home? Not that, you know, everybody is going to suffer from COVID, but the impact, the stress, and the anxiety. How do we care for them at home? And also, if you can link it to how we care for somebody who has either recovered, because we have no deaths, and most of our people have spent about 21 days so how, how 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 long would it take for one to you know quickly get back to their feet okay thank you walter i can hear you clearly and um, i'm glad to be part of this discussion so if i get your question right how do we care for our people at home who are sick of covid or who are anxious so which uh, i just need clarification on that Walter, can you hear me? Yeah, Jen, you can go on. Okay, so um, I will go to the people who are anxious, who the people we're living with and anxious. It can be ourselves, because now everyone is anxious about COVID, about getting it, about the people who are affected, and then about what will come when they go back to the workplace since the lockdown is done. So what we can do is we need to talk to these people first and foremost. If you're the one who is anxious, find a person that you can confide in. Tell them about your worries, about your fears. Okay. Because a problem, uh, a problem shared is a problem halved already. Acknowledge the fears that you're having that could lead to anxiety disorders. So once a person comes to you, then you can listen to them brainstorm on solutions so that the person doesn't degenerate. They don't go into the extreme levels of anxiety. Um, and the people who have suffered uh, COVID and are recovering, uh, it's a, a constant talk therapy. It's constantly telling them that it all will be well, accept the new normal, commit to the new behaviors, the washing of hands, the 
uh, safe distance, um, and we call it, uh, we, I, I would try to call it physical distance, the new social distance. So accept the new normal and then commit to the new behaviors that will help you overcome this uh, and break in this period. Okay, so uh, as you, you know, do all that, how do we determine that, you know, the character and behavior of probably my little child who's been traumatized or, you know, anybody in the family who's been traumatized uh, by the kind of situation that we're in or that we're dealing with is getting better or there's no, uh, the person is not getting better, you know, it's just stagnant or it's actually getting worse. Okay. So uh, the way we get to know that someone might not have, a, um, might not be in their right senses is change behavior. We observe the behavior of the person. So even when we are determining whether the person is getting better from their anxiety or an anxiety disorder if it has been diagnosed is if their behavior is coming back to normal okay so what when we say normal is if a person was uh, like dr ben had said earlier if a person was bubbly before would talk would be open and now the person is closed in and this has taken you know it's a new it's a new trait in them or if your child who used to play independently would go outside the house and play on their own clings to you he or she wants to be with mommy all the time, okay? If a person, if you yourself, as maybe the head of the family or the mother in the family, uh, are not yourself, your moods change there and then, you're not sleeping well, you're not, no, you're not eating well, you, you, your attention is, your attention span is not the normal one, then that means those are the symptoms. So if we are doing the treatment or if you're doing the therapy, for you to determine that the person has gone back to normal, is you still observe the behavior that indicated the person wasn't okay. So is the person, has the person gone back to their pattern of sleeping at night? Are they getting their full rest? Has the person's appetite come back? Okay, is the person now more stable? His mood is stable, he's not napping at everyone in the house. You know, some have become violent. So has the person come back they are normal behaviors. They are no longer beating up everything that they are seeing or verbally abusing, you know, verbally insulting people that are with them. So you check on those those behavioral traits that indicated the person wasn't okay. Then you do a, make a list and then find out are they going back to the person that you knew before this uh, epidemic or pandemic? Are they, you no, know, is the person the same Walter coming back? So if you see that that water is not coming back, they're instead going down the road. They're instead from before they, were, they would snap at you and, you know, now they are physically beating you. Or if you are talking to water and water doesn't answer back for the next 20 questions, and before water would be attentive to you, would you know, respond correctly. Or is the person seeing things that they're not seeing? Because it can go to that level, as, do, as Professor Noelin said, it depends on the level at which the person is. So if you see that you're talking to this person, you're giving them encouragement, and they're not getting better, then it's best to seek professional help. You go to any facility, both private and government, that are providing mental health services. Then seek a professional opinion, and then the people will get you into a treatment plan. All right. Um, finally, uh, for you, as you deal with people, what do you pick from their kind of characteristic? You know, as a community, are we people who quickly respond to issues of mental health, or uh, do we, you know, take a back seat? Are we lax about it? And what do you think we need to improve generally? Walter, if I can say, and I think all my colleagues will agree with me, is a person to come out for a mental health issue, it has to be the last resort. People do not like seeking help for mental health related issues. You know, that's why most people degenerate and they bring them, what, what people say mad, they bring them at that level of severity, yet they could have got help earlier and then be on their way to recovery. But because of the stigma related to mental health issues, even a person, even a person who knows they're not well will not take that help. 
the family members will know the person is not well. They will first make excuses for the person and then try to convince the person that actually have a problem. So it's a long time before a person comes for help regarding mental health issues. However, what I, uh, well, I would urge everyone out there that this is the new normal, okay? If we do not work on our mental health, that means all the other things will not work well. If you uh, uh, okay, then you will not have time to plan for that business. If you're constantly worried about uh, that job that you that you are at, you will not have the mental space to actually do the job very well. So it is not it's, it's not a, a normal thing for people to willingly and quickly come for mental health care, but I think it should be the new normal, just like the new time. It should be the new normal. If you're mildly worried that maybe I might have anxiety disorder, you know, or if you don't have someone to talk to at home, you seek, seek these people. It's not that when you come to Butavika or you go to any other referral hospital or you come to safe places that you can't function normally, that you immediately declared mad. No, you can just come to talk to a therapist. You come and seek an opinion of a psychiatrist. Come and seek an opinion of a psychologist. Have a talk. You know, it could help you with even that issue that you think is, is not related to your health, but you're constantly worried about it. You know, it could be your, your business, it could be your job, it could be, it doesn't have to know that now um, I am running around and I'm in a state of you know, disorientation. Come talk to these people. It should be the new normal in Uganda. It's the new normal elsewhere. So let us normalize it as well. Thank you, Walter. All right, I'm, I'm going to uh, quickly pass it on to Dr. Lukwata, who is the focal person from the Ministry of Health. Uh, I'll come back to my panel here in studio uh, for the uh, continuation of our discussion. But uh, Dr. Lukwata, if you can hear us, the Ministry of Health, you know, is in charge of, uh, you know, our health generally as a country and, you know, the well-being of the country's population. Jen there, you know, raises issues that uh, our mental health issues are not taken so seriously, uh, not just because there is no information out there, but somehow we, you know, take a back seat and wait for somebody to, you know, go deep into depression and, you know, many of those things. Uh, what is the ministry, you know, doing to ensure that we actually understand that this is a big problem that we need to deal with as quickly as we can. Okay, thank you very much, Walter. And thank you for inviting me to this um, webinar. Yes, um, that's a very good question and, and a quite a heavy one. But uh, I will try to break it down into a few steps as I can, I can take on it. Um, the first thing is, yes, it's true. We always take the back seat in, in as far as dealing with mental illnesses is concerned. And um, Actually, it's very unfortunate. But I think, just like all my colleagues have talked about, it is um, our ideologies is what we've been told is, um, I mean, the stigma that is attached to mental illnesses. And this one stretches not only from the individual, but it goes to the family, but also to the planners. You will, know, you will find that um, if you just looked at the budget, for instance, the Ministry of Health. It's, it's a very small budget that is put under mental health and even psychosocial support. And even our focus is mainly for the health facility, on the health facility side of things. Like we deal with those that are unwell. We, on, we, do, not, we do not deal with the normal population, yet we know that um, we all need have to be stable. We, all need, we don't have to wait to become very ill to take care of our mental health. Even the terminology itself is not well understood by everyone. When we talk about mental health, people even imagine that it's the mental illness that we're talking about. And yet the health is really health. That's like we can talk of physical health, and then we talk of you know, the infections and the illnesses that happen on the other side of things. So it, it really stretches from, from so much. It's the information mainly that we do not have, perhaps. Um, even the way we package our information as we are giving it, we just stigmatize uh, 
uh, mental issues somehow. So, but you're asking what have we done about it as a Ministry of Health? Our our role is of course to set standards, and uh, if I could just narrow it down to what to the to the COVID epidemic. Mm. Um, I just want to say that uh, we are setting standards for both the health workers and uh, the, those that are affected. For the families and those that are seemingly normal, I'm putting the same, I'm saying seemingly, and I'm putting it in quotes, because everyone is affected negatively as far as mental health is concerned. However, we are putting a lot of stress on those that are affected, mm -hmm. on the patients, on their families, but also the health workers. And in here, let me, I could start off with the health workers. For the health workers, we have, we have set aside, uh, we, uh, um, how can I say? we have um, put in place a process of how health workers are going to care for these people. We have put uh, a number of, uh, a number that is help that can fit so that different shifts, person cannot work uh, like maybe from morning to evening, and it's only one person taking care of these people. This is a this is a normal process, but uh, this is what normally happens in other times when they are just getting into health facilities, getting malaria and coughs and fevers. But when it comes to an epidemic, the issues are a little different. We'd like to reduce as much um, exposure as possible, so we put in place these shifts that are not normal shifts in the normal you know working days. So that is one thing that we do to protect our our health workers, both psychologically but also physically. Uh, the other thing is that we put aside we put aside uh, a motivation package. There is what we call a hardship allowance. This is um, this is an allowance that is given to someone who accepts to enter an isolation unit. A person who accepts to treat someone who every other person would run away from. It's, we used to call it a risk allowance, but we are now calling it a hardship allowance, and this is still in court. So, yeah, we, we, we provide this for our health workers, but also before and a health worker accepts to enter into the facility, I mean, into this isolation unit that is the way to treat people with COVID or with their special diseases. We prepare them psychologically. There's what we call psychological first aid. I'm sure most, many listeners are hearing this for the first time. They just know there are no more ABC as a first aid. We, too, in mental health, we have what we call psychological first aid. When someone is, is exposed to a very terrific or terrifying event, there are certain processes they go through, and uh, in order to ease them, in order to help them through, is what we can offer psychological first aid. And this can be done by just yes, the professionals, but even a normal person who first comes to the rescue of this person can, can be able to offer this psychological first aid. So yeah, these are things that we prepare our health workers with before they actually enter the system. Uh, the other thing is, um, uh, we offer the psychological first aid. I mean, sorry, the psychosocial support to the help. I mean, to the to our patients. We need to talk to them. We need to offer the counseling services. We offer um, yeah, counseling and any other. We even provide the basic needs because most of the people are stressed because of lack of basic needs because of lack of information. So for us as a mental health uh, providers. We provide this information that any other person would have missed providing. We also provide the basic needs because those are also stressed people. If someone does not have maybe a cup to take their meal, or they do not have, they have only one one set of pants, or they they didn't carry maybe a toothbrush, or you know that alone can just stress a person while they're quarantine or even isolation. So these are things that we ensure that we provide as mental health providers. So the other last one that I could mention here are the helplines. Uh, most of you have have, uh, have known, I think we've shared the helplines for the Ministry of Health. Initially, they were only bringing on alerts, but uh, lately we are we are also opened up for talking to our counselor or a psychologist. So, you know, if you want to talk to a counselor and you feel you down and you need to share some of your feelings, yeah, we are we are put up we are put up a, a helpline. Which can where people can call in and be supported, but as you rightly said, and my colleagues have already said, very many people are seem to put this at the last as the last resort. They do not want many people are fearful to sharing their problems. They would rather maybe solve them by themselves or keep quiet about it. But uh, we've heard the scientists have told us that once you keep something underground, it just continues to grow there, and the moment it comes, I mean, when it comes out, it comes out in a more 
going terrific way and that is where we get the mental illness that's the full blast mental illnesses maybe lastly i could just say that our services are actually open in as far as the mental health facilities within the regional referral hospitals we are set aside for the COVID treatment units. We have provided, we are continuing to provide the mental health services as mm -hmm. an outpatient, on an outpatient basis in all those facilities which had, which were providing mental health services. So briefly, that is what we are doing as a ministry of health. But we are also putting out information to, to encourage people not to take alcohol. And of course, and of course, tobacco. Tobacco is the other thing that we are very much worried about, and there's a lot of science that is coming out, telling us how it can be so dangerous to, I mean, those people who are actually smokers have a higher likelihood of having severe disease. So this is some, this is all the information we try to give out, and I am happy that uh, our colleagues, the nutritionists are there, they can just continue to talk about this. And uh, yeah, over to you, Walter, unless there are any other questions, I could just deal with those ones. Okay, uh, so you, you know, gave quite a bit of explanation there, but, you know, some studies that were done, including one by the World Health Organization, uh, you know, 2006, and others have come up even after those years, you know, they still show that we have inadequacies in, uh, you know, facilities that deal with mental health. And I like also putting, you know, a close look at, you know, factors that we're looking at. If, if we're talking about mental health and being a big problem in the country, what do the statistics say? How many people, for example, out of 100, you know, have uh, mental health issues? You probably have done research at the ministry. Yes, thank you very much, Walter. Unless, unfortunately, you're asking me for the very difficult questions. Now, one of the things that I need to put out to the public and whoever is listening and can help we have not had uh, a latest survey on most of the mental illnesses that we have in this country. Most of the ones that, most, the most, uh, most of the figures that we have are based on small researches that have been done in, in institutions of higher learning as, you know, research and, uh, you know, for academic purposes mainly. The only research that, I mean, the only survey that we have had lately are those of substance abuse. You know, actually, when we talk about mental health, maybe just let me say this, when we talk about uh, mental health, it also, it includes mental illnesses, it includes um, a neurological disorders, and also substance abuse. So under mental health and having those mental disorders as they were, like the schizophrenia, the bipolars, and anxieties, we've not had a, a nationwide survey uh, to talk about, I mean, to tell us that, that the magnitude of the problem. I have been putting this up, I put it up to my colleagues in the Uganda Bureau of, of, of Statistics, to just help us with this but it's something that is also not very easy given the dynamics that are there remember doctor um, professor has told us that there are those different forms mild moderate and severe and uh, unfortunately some of these if, if someone is mildly un anxious for instance they may never be able to uh, be given this diagnosis and they may be just maybe they'll be just cancelled and that kind of thing so they may not necessarily be given medication so that they come into our into the figures into the ministry of health so briefly we do not have a nationwide service for most of the mental illnesses we only just have a few for epilepsy we have a few on uh, alcohol use and then tobacco use those are the few statistics that i have and i could just tell you that uh, for every 10 people at least three people have epilepsy that is the the brief um, summary that I could give for the epilepsy. And for alcohol, for alcohol, we have 30% of the people. That is uh, also, again, uh, three for every, you know, 30%. 30% of our population, adult population, actually are taking alcohol. But unfortunately, it is 9.8% of, 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 of the population that are actually uh, having uh, drinking problems. I mean, that's a very, a very big number. That is up to about four four million people are having problems with alcohol, and uh, when it comes to tobacco, I am I am glad a little bit to inform that for the tobacco we are we are having some reductions, especially among the young people. We are seeing less children now taking on tobacco use, but for the adults, the numbers have continued to be high. We are still uh, we are still up to seven point eight percent, 
and uh, that is still very high for it, such a dangerous condition. For the others, like the depression, we are relying on WHO uh, surveys that are telling us that it is a quarter of the population, that is 25% of the population, will at one time in their lifetime get uh, depression. For the schizophrenia, it's, it's the schizophrenia of course with very overt uh, mental illness, and uh, they talk of about 2% of our population actually have this condition. However, most of our people may never get into the health facilities, so they cannot be picked from there. And that's why we need a survey that is outside the health facility level. Then maybe the other thing that I could say is that uh, the numbers are continuing. For instance, we did, uh, we, did we analyzed our data, mm. uh, our health management information system data, and we noted that uh, there had been a 6% increase in the last uh, 10 years in the numbers of people reporting mental illnesses. So meaning that they are on the rise, but it could also mean that our services are getting better. So many more people are coming up like to take up services, but we cannot undermine the fact that also mental illnesses are, are becoming more because of anyway, the, the reasons why mental illnesses, I mean, why people get mental illnesses. They're all, all of, they're all there with us. They're all increasing the worries and so on. So, and I am also not shocked that after this COVID, we shall see lots of, uh, we shall see very many people actually coming up with mental illnesses, even those that could have maybe not manifested, but because they're going through this period, that may just necessarily trigger off their mental, uh, their first episode of the mental illness. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lukwata, for, you know, that detailed information. And of course, you talked about the figures and you say a quarter of our population is likely, you know, to suffer from depression, which is a, a very uh, sad thing, uh, which means we really need to take care. But Dr. Lukwata, if you can stay with us, we'll come back to you later. Let me move uh, to the studio here. And for those who are watching us uh, from your homes or from wherever you are, we did tell you to send through your questions because we'll sample some few of them. And I already have a question here from Flavia Nasaka. And uh, she specifically says the question goes to Professor Nakasuja. Uh, it, it, you know, it's also about the research, and I wanted to, you know, ask you about that. Is Makere University doing any studies to establish the relationship between COVID and mental health, and to what extent have Ugandans been mentally affected by the pandemic? But then, before that question, you were urging me to, you know, Tell me about something <laughs> about MAD. I know you people don't like it in your profession because it doesn't exist, but the dictionary has it uh, to mean many other things. Right, uh, and you're right for, for you to say that it, the dictionary has it to mean other things. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we really have to fight against in improving mental health and having people uptake the services and for them not to come very late is for us to move away uh, from words that are maybe derogatory or abusive, um, that are stigmatizing. So we have uh, migrated from that word. I don't pronounce it, <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we talk about mental health. And, and as you've heard, most of uh, the other people, including yourself, that is the terminology. Uh, that would like to encourage uh, because mental health is very wide there are so many disorders that to which that word is um, us usually I liken to is uh, to people who may be either walking you know around aimlessly or shouting or crushing things and that is the smallest of the numbers for people who may have mental health problems so even the ones who may not be presenting in such a picture will shy away from a service if they think they are going to be, you know, um, ascribed to that yeah. kind of, uh, you know, description yeah. for the challenges that they have. Uh, the things we are talking about today, anxiety, depression, do not present in that kind of way. Yeah, yeah so um, I, I just wanted to, you know, mention that, that we are way, the, the, the range is very wide. Yeah. And uh, we would like to reduce stigma and encourage people to come for services early enough before things actually 
maybe escalate to those kinds of disorders, but that's the smallest percentage. Yeah. Now to come to the question about research, yes, we are doing research on, uh, uh, on COVID um, among uh, individuals who are admitted into hospitals. We are exploring how much things like anxiety, if they will develop PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, if they, are, uh, they have depression, if they've even thought of dying or how much stigma they are feeling within their communities. And now that they are back, uh, we are explore, exploring those things. I know there are other researchers at Makere who are looking into training of mental health workers about um, you know, COVID and um, its treatment and how they, you know, how they, are p they perceive their jobs now that yeah. COVID has come. I know there are other people who are trying to reach out countrywide uh, to look at the influence uh, that COVID may be having on mental health um, well-being of individuals countrywide. Yes, yeah. so there is a lot of research that is ongoing. Uh, this funding has uh, mainly come in from um, the Makere Research Innovation Fund uh, that I think is uh, managed in collaboration with Ministry of uh, Science and Technology. And then there's also um, monies that are coming in from um, other places uh, like UNICEF. So yes, there's a lot of research going on. So we'll be able to provide answers uh, very soon about these things. You can tell us what you've seen so far? Um, among the patients, uh, everyone was anxious, but as I told you at the beginning, that is expected. So if we measure levels of anxiety, you've just been diagnosed, you'll be in the roof. <laughs> you'll not be sleeping. It's you know, a natural reaction. But uh, in getting to people who may be uh, persisting with a disorder long before you've uh, actually catered for their problems. Uh, I may not be able to give you a figure because that uh, data collection is still ongoing. Uh, the one thing I can tell you is that in clinic, because we've continued to run the mental health clinics in Mulago and elsewhere, I, do, I have been receiving individuals who have adjustment disorders that Dr. Kimana uh, talked about in the beginning and adjustment with anxiety, people who are put into quarantine and were not able to get into touch with their families, oh, that caused problems, so people actually did come to clinic. I've had older citizens, these are individuals who are 60 and above, getting so worried about getting infected and becoming very frantic about, you know, catching COVID, knowing that they are a high-risk population. So yes, the you know the cases are there, but uh, in terms of giving you figures, that will come at a later date. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Professor Nakasuja, for that insight. Doctor Benedict, I want us to now look at coping with stress because we have to live with COVID. You know, we can't shy away from that fact until probably vaccine, the vaccine is found. But how would you advise somebody to, you know? Uh, adjust their lifestyle to actually uh, ensure that they have reduced stress levels. Especially for children. I want you to also incorporate in children who are you know, going to be told to go back to school but they've been you know, seeing this whole COVID thing and you know, they may be scared that we are going to contract COVID when we go out of home. How do we deal with that? Thank you very much. It's a very important question. How do we adjust to the new normal? So one of the things we need to know is um, things have changed. So how do we accept whatever is happening to us? One is we need to be kind to ourselves. We need to start defining uh, how a new day is, a good day. Because before the pandemic came, you describe a good day as you've achieved A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. Now the description of a good day is going to change. Two, we need to worry about things that we can change. I always tell, I have a friend of mine who looks at the world meters, uh, worldometer, there. That's, mm -hmm. that's a website that shows you the numbers of, uh, of, of people affected. So let's worry about things we can change. What is that that you can change? Social distance, 
wash your hands, avoid touching the soft parts, wear a mask wherever you're going. So those are things you can change. Not you worrying about the shooting numbers. To this morning was telling me, oh, Brazil now is the numbers are shooting. Okay? Three is um, one of the things we need to do is you talked about physical health. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, physical exercise. It's very, very important to start exercising. Quite a number of chemicals are released that we call endorphins that help you in being able to feel good and feel better. And of course, nutrition that Dr. Kassenen talked about. For the children, for the children, it's very, very important, like Professor talked about, to actually have an honest conversation with our children because they're going to ask daddy, mommy, what is this happening? Why aren't we able to go to school? When are we going to be able to go to school? So we should have an honest conversation with them, listen to them, and actually try to explain to them what is happening. Two, we need to help them get their mind off the COVID. I call it distraction. So you distract their minds, get them away from the thoughts of thinking about the pandemic, the thoughts of not being able to go to school by having fun, exercise, color, and have puzzles, play, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's very, very important to listen to what they say. Um, it's also very important to avoid uh, the very negative coping mechanisms, like going to use substances, alcohol, and so on and so forth. Um, as a fact, a friend of mine told me that actually probably the numbers of alcohol, people consuming alcohol have actually gone high, yeah. even if the bars are not open. So. Those are among the negative coping mechanisms we want to avoid. And let's limit the time we spend on the TV watching things related to COVID mm. and so on. Because this, what it does, it heightens the anxiety and increases anxiety. So let's worry about things we can control. Okay. Uh, and uh, so in, in short, you're telling the people to stay away from us, the newsmen uh, and women uh, who give them daily updates on COVID-19. And somebody, you know, responded after I had tweeted about the results uh, the other day when we had uh, 30 plus new infections and said, you know, uh, what else do we need to do? You know, I told them you uh, probably keep yourself safe and, you know, don't mind about the infected people. If you're not infected, then, of course, you'll be the difference in your community. Uh, Dr. Kasenini. We are at home and, you know, we have changed our patterns in many aspects. Sleep, feeding, uh, we are either overeating or probably not even eating at all. But we will have to get back to, you know, the new normal and, of course, our daily routines. For somebody who had interrupted sleeping patterns, what would be the best advice? And, of course, this, you know, is a lifestyle adjustment. So, um, first of all, um, it's important to understand that um, getting good quality sleep is important um, for your immunity and also for your mental health. And so I think one of the things is people need to appreciate that um, eventually we will have some new way of living in this society, but we should not totally change to the point where we cannot cope going back. Um, I think, like you, you asked about exercise earlier, I think people need to try and stay um, maintaining certain routines that will support their health. Um, and when it comes to sleep, I would say people should try and not, um, for example, spend late nights awake because, you know, you're thinking, I don't have to go to work or um, I don't have anything to do. Because ultimately this will interrupt your sleep cycle and eventually be a challenge to you. Regarding mental health, studies have shown if you sleep for less than five hours a night, your risk for mental health goes up. Um, so it's very important for people to maintain um, healthy sleep regimens, and I would recommend people to go to bed earlier and wake up earlier. It usually helps that way. Um, Dr. Ben already mentioned spending less time on the television. But when people are at home, I just want to say a few things. Um, you know, a lot of mental health can be tackled in small ways if it's not very advanced. And so people need to begin to appreciate first that 
as long as you start to see symptoms or any sign that your mental health is affected, that's the time to take some steps. He mentioned exercise. You know, the body, um, you know, the flight response, adrenaline, the hormone that comes when you're afraid, um, it prepares you for action. Now, usually in the past, that involved fighting or running. They call it the fight or the fight, flight, or flee. So if you run, sometimes your body actually feels that, you know, you're taking steps to release tension. And so you don't have to run necessarily, but you need to exercise, go outside, and, and, and spend at least 30 to 45 minutes. And outside is preferred because the, the body benefits from sunshine. The vitamin D hormone is the sunshine vitamin. And it's vitamin D deficiency is very much linked, again, to mental health issues. So people need to go outside and um, spend time in the sun. In fact, in these periods with restricted movement, it's even a great opportunity to get time outside. Um, but a few other things people can just think about is, um, like, uh, st we need to be informed, but not overly informed. Because this over-information through social media is what is driving anxiety and fear. Yeah. And as long as we realize that we need to get trusted sources of information and stick with those. I want to also just say that the way we respond is based on our perception. And we tend to see it as a difficult time. But we can also decide to focus on the gratitude and things that are going well. And Dr. Ben did mention this, that you know, when you say thank you and feel gratitude, your brain produces endorphins and chemicals and serotonin and GABA and things which really make you feel well and will help you cope better with anxiety. So I recommend that every day people should get two to three minutes and just focus on what you're grateful for. And just thinking, feel it, not necessarily focus, but feel it. It really, really is a very powerful thing. And I'll also just quickly say that should go along with deep breathing. You just spend some time outside and breathe deeply. You know, many people um, have not appreciated the power of deep breathing, but what this does is it releases tension in your body and it makes your mental health better. And many people will take deep sighs when they are stressed. That's the way the body tries to tell the body, the mind to calm down and to reduce tension. So these are simple things you can do at home. You just take five minutes, take deep breaths in and out. You focus on what you're grateful for. And, um, and eat, uh, eat well, go outside and exercise. But I want to really say that everybody listening and watching needs to appreciate that anybody and each one of us can be affected by mental health. There's a tendency to want to push this to the point where you have a psychiatric illness or you have severe mental health issues. But just staying at home and you know trying to figure out what will be the future can be stressful. And so this is the time for us to take these small steps to, um, to improve our mental health. And lastly, I'll just say, let's seek help where we need it. A lot of stigma people are afraid to, but there's a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. um, Butavika Hospital, Uganda Counseling Association. Um, you know, there's so many spaces. But as long as you feel um, like you're not coping well, it may be a time for you to reach out for help. All right, OK. so. For those who are watching, uh, we told you would sample some of your questions, so keep them coming. And of course, even after this, uh, you can always, you know, channel your questions uh, to all these people here. They are also, you know, available on social media. They are tech savvy, so they can respond to your questions right there. Don't sit on your question. Uh, I have one here from Trudy Tumusime. But this is really about government supporting people who cannot afford uh, what to eat and nutritiously beyond posher and beans. I, I don't know, Dr. Kassini, not to speak for government, but is there anything wrong with posher and beans? So, posher is generally a carbohydrate rich food, um, and beans are a combination of protein, a bit of carbohydrate as well. Um, they, there's nothing technically wrong with them, but you know, to be healthy, you need a, a, a balanced approach to your diet. Now, we have to be mindful that during COVID, there are many factors that may limit someone's access to food. And so I'm sure the government is doing what it can 
to support in the most basic way. But depending on your situation, um, if there is a way you can, you know, supplement your diet with a few simple other things, especially in the area of legumes, fruits, and vegetables, mm. many of which grow wildly, that is important. But I, there's nothing wrong per se with portion and beans. It's just that where necessary, you want to have more nutrients in your diet to kind of uh, ensure that you are, your immunity and your health is at the best point. Okay. Uh, Professor Nolan, and for the fact that you sit on the you know, Committee of Scientists for COVID-19, uh, how are you planning to help people who you know, are getting out of quarantine or even those who are healing? We had a, a very bad scenario in Chengira where a gentleman was beaten and he didn't even test positive for COVID-19. But, you know, people just suspected him and, you know, they started beating him. But, of course, even beating him itself was wrong to the fact that in case he had COVID-19, then <laughs> whoever touched him would be infected and they would be in isolation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what are you doing out there for those people? So Dr. Hofstra, in part of what she mentioned the ministry has done is, um, first of all, to ensure that uh, services for mental health have continued to be open. She also, I think, did mention that they've been doing a lot of training. I am aware that lots of training has uh, happened in uh, various uh, regions of the country to equip uh, the health workers on how to deal with the individuals who may be presenting with these uh, problems. As uh, Dr. Hak Akimana said, we are expecting more to come out now, even with increased uh, transport. So mm. we, we, we are ready. We are psyched for what's coming. Okay. And, and Dr. Uh, Benedict, what can the health uh, care providers do? And uh, especially for you know a community like uh, where the hospital Butarika is, what do you do for the community around there? They could be probably, you know, having uh, elevated stress levels. Right. Um, so what we do as uh, an institution is we have advocacy talks. Um, people go out and uh, talk to the community and. Uh, teach them how to deal with the different disorders and prevent them. Personally, I have taken a, a drive, uh, was May was Mental Health Awareness Month, so yeah. I made a series of 14 videos yeah. to actually create awareness mental health so that we are able to know what to look out for and prevent this. Yes, and I mean, this is part of the uh, means creating awareness so that people are able to appreciate mental health. Okay, so uh, I'm not certain if we still have our uh, two panelists online, but of course their contribution was well in and well taken. Yeah, and uh, we will not get back to them because we have about, you know, 15 or less minutes to, you know, conclude this. And, you know, if this was a football match, this is the last quarter, so I want each one of you to give the parting shot, which would probably be the winning goal, starting with Dr. Senene. Thank you, Walter. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this uh, group of panelists. Um, I think mental health is a very important issue, yes. and people need to become more aware of it. COVID-19 presents uh, unique situations around anxiety and fear that may um, worsen what was already existing or may bring about new problems. It's important for us all to think about ways, what we can do to really um, avoid getting into situations where we are unnecessarily um, triggering things that make us anxious. And um, largely, it's about trying to stay grounded, get the right information, and try and avoid fear, people who are driving fear. If you hang around people who are always negative and who are always driving the statistics of fear, that can be a harmful thing to you. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to understand that our bodies are designed to allow us to experience certain amounts of anxiety and fear in a normal way. 
and by eating healthily, exercising, um, drinking enough water, reducing our exposure to stimulants like alcohol, um, caffeine, energy drinks, tobacco, we really support our bodies to support us too in these kinds of situations. I will also say that um, if anybody is struggling with mental health, sometimes taking certain nutrients like omega-3s, uh, vitamin D, mm -hmm. and uh, especially v B vitamins can be very important to help you in a balanced time. We should also be mindful that um, we can take steps to adjust to the new way of life and focus on the things to be grateful for, especially that you're still alive and still have an opportunity to make a difference. Um, I lastly would like to say that um, we should always be um, open-minded and keep our eyes open to those who may be struggling with mental health issues and be able to recognize them, not stigmatize them, and either reach out to advise them to get help or to point them in the right direction. Because the earlier people are helped, the, the better they will, uh, will, 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 will manage in the long run. But um, it's a big, important issue. And as long as we realize COVID is with us, and so we need to start focusing on what we can do proactively going okay. forward. All right. Uh, uh, we still have Dr. Lukwata and uh, Jane on uh, online via Zoom. And I'll ask Jane to, you know, give us your parting shot very quickly. Yeah, thank you, Walter. Uh, my parting shot will be encouraging people to seek help uh, because of the circumstances. I know it's not, a, it's, it has gone beyond someone fearing to acquire COVID. It has gone beyond someone have, knowing someone who has COVID or having a COVID patient with them. It has gone towards someone thinking about the life out there. Or if I still have a job, some people have lost their jobs. Uh, some people, businesses are not going to survive. You know, so, and this is going to cause a little bit of um, anxiety. So if you feel that you can't handle the anxiety, or if you notice that your, your person, you know, is having tendencies Towards, towards anxiety, then help them stay level. There is a Butarika, the National Referral Hospital. There are psychiatric uh, wards in the, the government hospitals. There are private service providers, like safe places. So we are all here to help you so that you don't degenerate and for the opportunity and for this um, discussion with the experts as well. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Lukwata, we will also take your parting shot. We, uh, to encourage people to change their attitudes towards uh, new events or towards things that they are, they are faced with. Because if, if you do not fit into the situation in which you are in, you will bust. So the most important thing is to accept what you have, what is being presented in front of you. Say your serenity prayer, change those things that you can, learn the ones that you cannot be able to do, and, and learn to even accept what is available to you. Remember to be grateful, and do not forget to take water, not alcohol and not sugary or soda products. Water is the best. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Professor Nakasuja, I'll ask you to give your parting shot, but also, just briefly, uh, somebody wants to know how they can, you know, cope with or deal with anxiety, you know, without requiring to, uh, you know, elevate it and go to hospital, yeah. Yes. So, uh, dealing with anxiety, um, when you're in a difficult situation, number one, talking to someone about your situation is usually very helpful. Number two, try to get enough sleep, exercise, you know, the things we have mentioned here, yeah. and um, try to develop a solution towards that problem. 
So I'm speaking generally. Mm -hmm. So try to develop a solution to that problem. When you feel you have uh, reached your limits in being able to deal with the problem, you've talked to people, you've asked for advice, and it's not getting any better, then maybe you seek the help of a professional. Okay. Um, sometimes praying about things uh, is helpful. Uh, or praying about situations is helpful because in so doing, you do what Dr. Kasenene was talking about. You're taking deep breaths. You're appreciating the good that is happening around you mm. and not only focusing on onto the negative. Okay. Uh, so usually those are things that people may do and it, it will usually lift them out of um, that difficult situation. Yeah. Where it's possible seek help if it is um, you know, to gain advice or gain assistance from another person, please reach out. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's only when you've done all those things and it's not helping that maybe then you can come to uh, a professional. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to end it there? Do we take that as a parting shot? So, so my parting sh yeah, take that as my parting shot. Yeah. But also yeah. I want the community to be aware that even as uh, we continue with uh, COVID, um, you know, things have changed. Um, wash your hands, wear a mask, sanitize, and um, ensure that um, you do not spread the virus to other people. Mm -hmm. So personal safety first. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Dr. Benedict Akiman, uh, finally from you as we conclude today's session. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my parting shot is um, to everyone listening and watching, once you have a brain, you are at risk of mental illness. So please be kind. Be kind. Do unto others what you want them to do unto you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, my panelists, for today. Uh, Dr. Paul Kasenene, Dr. Benedict Akimana, Dr. Afsal Ukwata, and Jeanette Kantalama, who joined us online. And Professor Noel Nakasuja, thank you very much for sparing time. Uh, you know, to come and have this conversation. Uh, this conversation is not ours. This conversation was for you who is watching us from wherever you are, in your living room, probably outside your compound, or, you know, wherever you are. And uh, take these things that have been said here as seriously as you can. Uh, don't be the reason why your neighbor is going to get infected. And also don't be the reason why your neighbor is going to infect you. So let's protect each other. Wear your mask every time you must head out to the public. Uh, wash your hands. Sanitize if you can access or afford the sanitizer. But then also, uh, you know, pray. Prayer helps. Thank you very much for being a great audience and for tuning in. And of course, if you have any further questions, you will be able to uh, send your questions to our team here they they are on social media and with that we'll call this uh, the end of the second session of the webinar from government here and we will be able to come back next time with another topic for discussion good evening <laughs>